so good morning. I want to start off by sharing with you guys a story from God's Word. So one time, Jesus' disciples came to him, and they said to him, Lord, how are we going to know uh, when, the, when the age is coming, the end of the age is coming, how will we know, what will the signs be that you're going to return to us? And so Jesus shared with them many things. He talked to them for, for a while, and after a time, he shared this parable with them. He said, the kingdom of heaven is going to be like ten virgins who take their lamps and they go to meet the bridegroom. And, and there were five of the virgins who were foolish and five of them that were wise because the foolish ones brought their lamps, but they didn't bring any extra oil with them. But the wise ones, they brought casks of oil with them so that they would be prepared for a wait. And the bridegroom was delayed for some time and they all grew tired. And after a time, they all fell asleep. But at midnight, a loud call rang out, said, the bridegroom is here, come to meet him. And they all woke up quickly and trimmed their lamps. Then the foolish virgins went to the wise ones and said, give us some of your oil, because our lamps are about to go out. And the wise ones said, there's not enough oil for all of us. Therefore, go quickly, go to the dealers and, and get more oil in return. So the foolish ones went and did this, but as they did, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went with him into the wedding feast, and the doors were closed. Now, after a while, the foolish virgins got back, and when they got back, they saw that the door was closed, and they knocked on the door, and they said, Lord, Lord, let us in. But the bridegroom replied to them, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. And then Jesus said, Be watching, therefore, because no one knows the day or the hour. This is a story from God's Word. Now, if you're in his community group or you're with us in the, the young adult ministry, you can definitely tell I went to the Zach Nile School of Bible Storying. Um, I think it's a, a really helpful way to, to learn God's Word and to, to experience God's Word. And I think that, that talking about a parable this morning, it really lends itself to that format. And uh, I'm really excited about sharing this passage with you guys this morning. I think it's a, a fantastic parable. I think there's so much for, for all of us in this passage. Um, and so, so we're going to look at it, and we're going to learn from it. And, and right at the top, before we get going, I want to lay some groundwork um, before we get into it so that we can get more out of it when we, when we sort of look at the body of the text. So I want to give you guys a little bit of background. And first, I want to talk about parables. Because we're in a parable this morning, and that's a little bit different than going through Paul's letters or going through the Gospels. Every, um, every different genre that we look at in Scripture, there's going to be some different things that we want to know. So with this parable in specific, uh, this is a structure that Jesus uses often, not in every parable, but in many of them. And it's what's called a simple three-point parable. It's simple because there's one main point. And that main point is that we need to get ready. And then it's a three-point parable because there are three main characters, and we're going to learn a little bit from each of them that's going to point to that one main point. All right, so usually in this structure, when there's a three-point, there's, there's one authority figure. A lot of times it will be a king or a father or, or a master of some kind. In this case, it's the bridegroom. And then we have two contrasting subordinates, so two characters beneath them who are usually opposites. So think about the prodigal son and his brother, or think about the, the two debtors. In this case, we've got the foolish virgins and the wise virgins. And so we have these three main characters, and we can look at each of them, we can learn something from each of them, and it's going to point to this one big point. So that's just a word on, on the structure of this parable and the story that we're going to look at. Next, we need to know a little bit about the historical context. I say a little bit because this can be somewhere where we can we can go down this rabbit trail forever because it's really interesting. It's interesting to know all the little things about what's going on there, but, but I think that we don't need too much, but we need something. It wouldn't work for me to just tell you, you know, it's about a wedding. You know weddings because I don't know about you guys, but at my wedding, like, we didn't go to Lisa's parents' house and, and to, you know, make all the agreements, and then there wasn't, like, tiki torches while we, like, ran to my house for a big party. That's not how it worked for my wedding. I don't know about you guys. So... So we need to understand what's going on in this, in this first century Jewish context. What's going on with this wedding? What are the virgins all about? Where's their lamps come into play? So, so here's the basics of it. And that was the way their weddings were structured. They would go to the bride's house. 
there would be, um, they would work out some of the technicalities, they'd figure out the dowry and those kinds of things. So there would be this, this service that happens at the bride's house. And then the virgins are basically bridesmaids to the bridegroom. So they're there to serve the bridegroom and a big role that they play is this procession that goes from the bride's house to the groom's house. And at the groom's house, there's a huge feast and a huge party. It's the main event of the wedding. So, so the virgins, their role is to be there for that procession. That's a big part of their job. And in these weddings, the bridegroom is, he's kind of the star of the show. He's, he's the really important character. So, so with that context and, and knowing sort of what the parable is, we can look back at our story and we can understand it a little bit better. So the, the reason that the virgins wanted the extra oil was for their lamps, so their lamps wouldn't go out, so that they would last until it was time to go to the feast. Um, we, we see in this one that it took a long time at the bride's house, right? The, the bridegroom gets delayed for, for quite a while, for longer than they were expecting, and that's why everyone falls asleep. And then, of course, we see that the foolish virgins don't have enough oil. They, they ask for some oil from, from the wise ones. They say, man, you got to go run to Walmart real quick and get some and when they get to the when they get to the party the door is closed and like i said i think that the main point of this is very clear and that's that's that we need to have a sense of urgency we have to get ready because the bridegroom is coming and nobody knows when so in, in chapter 24 uh jesus has been talking about this the same theme and he's shared a couple of stories already and the point of the stories he's shared up to this point is, um, is that the Son of Man is coming quickly. And so in those ones, the character that represents the Son of Man comes before anyone expects. It's, it's really quick and sudden. And, and that was the point of those stories. In this one, we see the opposite. We see that it's, it's a delay that's the main part. It's that he takes longer than they expected. And because of that delay, it, it leads to some complacency. So... So it's helpful for us to see he's been talking about he's going to come quick, he's going to come quick, and now he's saying, hey, it might be a while, and if it's going to be a while, you've got to be ready to wait, and you've got to be ready to, to leap into action, because it's going to take a while, and then it's going to be sudden. All right, so that, that's, that's sort of the gist of our parable. That's sort of the main idea. Now, I think that there is a ton that we can learn from it, and like I said, I think that we can learn from every character, and I think the most helpful way for us to investigate this parable is to take a look at each of the main characters or, or groups of characters and see what we can learn from them. So that's what we're going to do, and we're going to start off with, with the group that I think we can learn the most from, and that's the foolish virgins. Now they're going to teach us that you have to get ready for yourself. And while I was getting ready for this sermon, one of my friends shared a story that I thought was, was a perfect picture of of their experience in this parable. My friend talked about how when she was younger, her, her mom would go shopping on Saturdays and that it was a pretty regular thing that her mom would go shopping. And when she was going shopping, she would give them a list of chores and say, hey, the, these things have to be done before I get home. And it was very clear the expectation was the chores need to be done when I get home, otherwise there's gonna be consequences. And she said, without fail, mom leaves and, you know, they get right to work on the chores. Work. No, they never did that, right? Kids don't, that's not how kids work. So they would, they would play games, they would watch TV, they would eat cereal, but they, they wouldn't get to the chores. And then she talked about the, the terrifying feeling when you see mom's car pulling into the driveway and the chores aren't done. And there's this quick, frantic frenzy to get as much done as they could before she walked in the door. And she said that she, you know, to this day, she can still remember that, that fear. We talked about, you know, every time she hears a garage door open, whether or not her heart rate just increases a little bit. And I think that, that that's a good picture of, of what the foolish virgins experience in this story. They're not prepared for the long wait. They don't have enough oil, and ultimately they get left out of the party. And I think that the original audience, just like today, I think that the eternal implications of that we're, we're clear to that original audience, just like today when we see that. We, you know, there might be some questions from the story, but we're not saying, what does that mean? I, I think it's quite clear. All right, so the foolish virgins, uh, if, if we had to characterize them and we had to use a word that I think is used a lot today, I think that, that they are hypocrites to an extent. See, they agreed to be a part of this marriage ceremony. They agreed to, to be a part of the bridegroom's group. They were in the wedding party, and they were there to serve the bridegroom, but they weren't 
ready to, to invest their time. They weren't ready to wait. They were, they were ready for a quick ceremony and then get straight to the party. So, so there's definitely this, this issue there, right? This hypocrisy. There's also some, some entitlement issues. Uh, they, they demanded the oil from, from the wise virgins. They didn't bring their own. I mean, they, they said, hey, give, give me yours. And then when they get back and the door is closed, they knock on the door. They're, they're fully expecting someone to, to let them in, even though they didn't do their part, even though they weren't ready. And, uh, and it's really easy for us to look at some of the bad guys in, in the Gospels, and it's really easy to point fingers and say, man, I don't want to be like them. I don't want to be like the Pharisees. I'm not, I'm not like the foolish virgins. And I'll tell you, this week I, I kind of fell into this trap. While I was preparing this sermon, the whole time I was preparing it, I was sort of putting myself in the, in the sandals of the wise virgins, and I was like, that's me. I got my oil. You know, I'm a pastor. I'm good to go. And, uh, and the more I looked at it, the more I thought about it, the more I was specifically preparing this part, I was like, man, I, if I look at the last week of my life, if I look at the last seven days, and I think about how much of that was, was spent with urgency for Christ, how much of that was was spent being ready. How much of that was the things that I would love to know, like, man, my last seven days, I, I did work. I, I didn't see the urgency. I thought that if Christ had come back then, he would have, he would have caught me sleeping. And so, so I saw some of that hypocrisy in myself, and I want you to be careful not to, not to just kind of, you know, knowingly nod about those foolish virgins and, and miss that, the guys, that's, that's us sometimes. And, and so the big problem, I think, that, that they had is that they weren't ready for themselves. They always expected someone else to bail them out. And uh, that's just not how it works in this life. You can't live on someone else's faith. So you, you can't come here Sunday to Sunday. Like, Carlin can stand here and he can preach the gospel to us and he can preach God's word. But Carlin can't believe the gospel for us. All right, you can go to Ron's office and he can give you good godly counsel, but he can't live your life for you. Same with Zach can challenge us to investigate our Bibles and love our Bibles, but he's not going to love our Bibles for us. And, and Caitlin's done a great job as the outreach director, giving us, um, giving us opportunities to live this kingdom-minded life, but she can't live that life for us. Guys, just like the foolish bridesmaids, the unprepared in this life, they're going to reach a point beyond return. So if you're here this morning and you're not a Christian, uh, I don't know if, if you've been coming to church your whole life and you've never quite bought it, or if someone invited you when you came to visit today, or, or maybe you've always just assumed you're a Christian and, and when you really think about it, you've never really made your faith your own, I want you to learn from the foolish virgins. All right, they weren't prepared, and like I said, they reached a point where it was too late. I would say, don't, don't wait. Turn to Jesus today. And if you're a Christian this morning, don't, don't miss your own hypocrisy. Don't, don't do what I did and, and assume that you're in this place, but, but your life doesn't at all point to that. All right, so that's what we can learn from the foolish virgins. But next, let's look at the wise ones. And I'll also I'll use bridesmaids women, this, all those terms are kind of interchangeable here. Um, the, wise, the wise bridesmaids are going to teach us to get ready despite others and despite everything else that's going on. All right, the, the wise bridesmaids, they're the counterpoint to the foolish ones, but they're the same in every single way except for that one very critical way, that they're ready. They've got the extra oil. And, uh, and, and right here is kind of a good spot to mention this idea of oil. So in some of the parables that Jesus teaches, there's a, there's a spiritual significance in every little part, and Jesus tells us that spiritual significance. In some of the parables, we really want to just look at those main characters, and we don't want to get too hung up on the little details. Don't get too hung up on the oil. Don't try and make the oil mean something that it doesn't necessarily mean, because if we want the oil to be the gospel— why didn't the wise virgins share the gospel, right? If we want it to be the Holy Spirit, why isn't there enough Holy Spirit to go around? So, so I would just say, don't get hung up on the little details. Don't get hung up on the oil. I think the more important idea is that idea of readiness in this, uh, in this parable. So what does is, what is ready look like? Uh, a picture that I really like to think of is uh, from the award-winning and very awesome Broadway musical Hamilton. 
And, and in Hamilton, it's a story of Alexander Hamilton, the, one of the founders of our nation, did, did a lot of work for that. And a big theme in the musical is, is how Hamilton is nonstop. He's, he's always at work, and he, there's this frenetic energy about him. And there's songs that say, why do you write like you're running out of time? Write day and night like you're running out of time. And the idea is that he was always at work. And the reason that he was always at work was because he was founding a nation, right? They were, he was setting all this new ground. But, but his character is characterized by this urgency and this, and this hard work. And I think that that's what's in view here. So if you're a Christian, what is that being ready? I think it's being a disciple. Like a great place to look at that is Matthew 4.19. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So if you're a disciple, you need to follow Christ. And, and he also says that I'm going to make you fishers of men. So he's transforming us into something. So if you're a disciple, you follow Christ and you're being transformed by Christ. And furthermore, if you're a disciple, you're on mission for Christ. We're fishers of men. So what is being ready? It's being a disciple, following Christ, being transformed by Christ, being on mission for Christ. I think another great place to look that, that we've looked as a church body recently is Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus teaches us how to live that Christian life. I think that's being ready, living out the Sermon on the Mount, finding ways to, to live the gospel like we talked about just this morning. So I think it's living with urgency as though the bridegroom might come today, but it's also having enough gas in the tank in case he waits another 30 or 40 years. You have to, you have to live this life despite the distractions and, and the way that people around you are living. I, um, I don't know, and I read up a little bit, but I, but I couldn't figure out, I don't know first century wedding prep, how it worked. All right, I'm not sure exactly how they did it, but I've been in some weddings um, in the 21st century, and, and the bridesmaids all get together, and they all get ready together. It's a whole thing. They spend the whole morning, they get ready together, and that's, that's a big part of it. And I can just imagine what it was like when, when they were getting ready for this wedding, and the, and the wise virgin said, all right, well, let's get, you know, I've got my cask of oil, and the foolish one's saying, man, what are you doing with that? I'm not going to, that doesn't go with my accessories. I'm not going to smell like olive oil all night. I'm not bringing extra oil. He's going to go in there, it's going to be 15 minutes, and then we're going to go to the feast. We don't, we don't need this extra oil. But, I mean, the wise bridesmaids had to make that decision despite what was going on around them. Again, that's conjecture. But they, they had to make that decision to, uh, to bring that extra oil. And today, the world is not going to encourage you to live your life for Christ. That, that's not what we're going to hear from, from the people around us, from the world. There are going to be some people that, that even pity us. Some people are going to say that, that we're crazy or that our faith is, is a crutch of some kind. And we need to love those people. And we need to share the gospel with those people. And we need to be patient with those people. But we also have to live this ready life despite everything that's going on around us and despite what those people are saying. We've got to uh, be like a fireman that's able to hurry up and wait, that train and train and train and are prepared to, to leap into action at a moment's notice, but also, from what I understand, and I don't know a lot, but I think that there's more waiting involved than actual firefighting and than actual fighting these crises. And so that, that's what we have to be ready to do. We have to be fully prepared, but we also have to be prepared to wait. So again, here, when we look at the, at the wise virgins, we can learn Christians live this ready life. If you, if you believe in Jesus, then live your life as if heaven was real, and live your life as if you actually want to be a part of that wedding feast, all right? And again, if you're, if you're not a Christian today, I'm, I'm glad that you're here. This is where we want you to be. We're so excited that you're here, but you need to hear that nobody can believe for you. I was listening this week to a podcast, and, and Justin Forsett was on there. He's a, a former NFL running back, and they were asking him about his faith, and, and what it was like in college being a big star, but, but also taking his faith seriously. And, and they asked if that was difficult for him. And he said that it wasn't that hard for him because he knew who he was in Christ. And he said, and I think this was interesting, he said, most people say when kids go to college, they lose their faith. But the truth of the matter is when kids go to college, they don't lose their faith. They lose their parents' faith. And, and I think that he's right to an extent. Nobody can believe for you. There's going to be a point when we have to give an account for our life, and mom and dad aren't going to be there. 
Carlin's not going to be there. You're not going to have your community group leader vouching for you saying this was their attendance. It, that, that's going to be on us. No one can believe for you. So, so hear that message clearly. Finally, we want to look at the bridegroom. What can we learn from the bridegroom in this story? And, and we're learning about getting ready. We, we've learned that we have to get ready for ourselves, that we have to get ready despite everything that's going on around us. And here we want to see that we're getting ready for a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. It's easy for us to get really busy and and do all kinds of things, but we need to fix our eyes on Jesus, on the bridegroom, like the song we sang this morning, with, with our gaze transfixed on Jesus' face. So the bridegroom is the main character of this story. He's not in it a whole lot. He's only in it a couple times, but, but he's the catalyst for everything that happens. All of, the, all of the big action in the story is because of the bridegroom. He's the star of the show, and, and we learn from the parable that that he takes a little while, he delays. And, and so we can learn that from this parable, that Jesus coming, well, Jesus has waited 2,000 years already, so there's been some wait, but when he comes, it's gonna be sudden, and we're gonna want to be ready. Now, the delay in the story says that, that he takes a while, and because he takes so long, the, all 10 virgins fall asleep. And uh, I'm not gonna point any fingers, got one or two sleepers in the crowd today, and that's okay. I'm not, I'm not going to tell you to elbow them and wake them up because remember, the wise ones and the foolish ones were asleep, so maybe they're wise and they know what's going on. So you don't have to, you don't have to wake them up. But I will say, sometimes church can be a sleepy place, and that can be a little bit of a problem. And, and I think that the big question that we have to ask ourselves is, can we wake up with urgency? All right, can we, can we trim the wick and, and leap into action? Can we make disciples and push back the darkness in our communities? And, and I ask that because I think that in this parable, the stakes are very, very high. All right, the wise virgins get to go in with the bridegroom, and they get to go to the wedding feast, and they get to enjoy the presence of our Lord. But the foolish bridesmaids, they get, they get left out in the cold. They get left out in the darkness. They knock on the door, but it doesn't open. They, they call out and they say, hey, it's us, let us in. And, and they hear, I think, a very, very chilling reply. It's similar to something we heard um, from Zach's sermon on the Sermon on the Mount a couple weeks ago. The bridegroom says, truly I say to you, I do not know you. And this group, they associated with the bridegroom. They were a part of his wedding party, but they didn't take him seriously. They weren't prepared to wait for him, and then they weren't prepared for his sudden arrival. So you have to be ready to have your gaze fixed on Jesus. Jared Wilson wrote an article recently, and, and I thought that it was really helpful. Maybe the best part of the article was the title. And the title was, Danger, Doing Jesus-y Stuff Without Knowing Jesus. And, and it talked about how we can, we can work really hard, and I'm calling for us to work really hard but to work hard with Christ in mind. He said that we can work really hard and then we can look to the things that we do and, and say that, that, we're, that we're good to go because of our hard work or, or that, that's what's going to save us is, is all the things that we did for Jesus. And he said that what we have to look at is the work that Jesus did for us. That's the only work that's going to save. So if you're a Christian, your heart has to belong to Jesus. You can't fall prey to that danger of doing Jesus' stuff without knowing Jesus. And, and again, if you're not a Christian, don't find yourself outside that door. All right, Jesus says to look out because nobody knows the day or the hour. That's sort of the point of the story. Is we don't know when he's coming back, but I mean, we're closer to it today than we were yesterday. And so, so I think that there needs to be some urgency. I think that that what I would encourage you to do is to, to turn from your sin and to turn to Jesus. He's the only way out of your brokenness. And that's because Jesus came down into our brokenness. And he lived on this earth. He, he lived among us. And he lived a perfect life. I was reading a book this week, and it talked about how Jesus never sinned. And it said that he, you know, he never even you know, wasted time. He never even argued with his parents. Jesus lived a perfect life for us. And then he died as a sacrifice for, for all of our sins. And when I say all of our sins, I'm not talking about the sins of the people of his day. I'm talking about us too. So Jesus died for us, and then he rose from the dead, and he's alive for us today. 
And so, so if you don't know Jesus today, I can tell you, you can try to get out of your brokenness in a lot of different ways. You can try and get all the education in the world and, and learn things, or you can try and get a really good job and work your way out of it. You can, you can try relationships. You can turn to someone else and see if they can fix you. But, but I'm here to tell you that the only way to get out of that cold night and into that party is by knowing the bridegroom and being known by him, by being one of his. So as we're winding down, I want to talk about one more way to be ready that, that's going to go in a slightly different direction, but it's something that I thought about a lot this week and something that's been on my heart that I wanted to share with you. And that's that I hope this sermon makes you want to read your Bibles a little bit more. So I want to challenge you guys this week to be like the Bereans in Acts 17 and just look in your Bibles and see if what I told you today was the truth. Just, just double check me in God's word and, and see if what I said was true. And I want to challenge you guys. We talked about a parable today and we learned about a parable. Parables are, are a great place to start. So, so go find another parable, a parable that you've always liked or one that you're interested in. Maybe one you've never studied and, and see if you can find the main characters of the parable and see if you can figure out what Jesus is trying to teach us and then how he's trying to teach us that through, through the characters and the different parts of the story. Uh, I think that parables are great because they're very instructive, they're very practical, and uh, ultimately they teach us about the kingdom of God, so that's going to be helpful for us. I just hope that your, your weekly Bible intake doesn't consist of listening to someone up here tell you what the Bible says. I want you to enjoy it for yourself. I think if we're going to know God, love people, and live the gospel, we're not going to know God apart from, apart from his word. So, so I hope that you guys love your Bibles and, and spend some time in your Bibles. Now, if I could boil this whole sermon down to one word, I think that word would be urgency. I think that's what Jesus is trying to teach us. We have to have urgency. And we can tell because the last line that he says is, Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So we need to be urgent. So if you have conflict in your life right now with someone, you need to work to resolve it sooner than later. If you've got a friend or a family member or a coworker who you, you've just felt a burden to share the gospel with, don't wait. Make, make those arrangements. Send that text today and, and catch up with them this week and share that truth with them. If you've been saying for years that, that you'll you'll be a Christian someday. You'll start coming to church someday. I'll take my faith serious someday when I'm ready. Don't, don't wait, all right? Because one of the great things about this story is, is that door is not shut yet, but one day it will be, all right? And finally, I, I want us to do a little bit of diagnostics. I want you to ask yourself some, some hard-hitting questions, or, or I'll ask them for you, and then you can ask yourself later. But, but I want you to think about, in light of this parable, how are you living today? Does your life look like a disciple's life? When, when was the last time that you shared the gospel? Do people scratch their heads when they look at the way that you choose to spend your time? Or does it make perfect sense to your neighbors and to the people around you? That was something that really convicted me. And then finally, are you trying to live on someone else's faith? Because you've got to get ready for yourself despite what others are doing. And you need to remember that this is not some abstract getting ready or getting ready for something. It's getting ready for someone. And that someone is Jesus. Let's pray. Father God, we, uh, we love you and we thank you for your word. Uh, Lord, we, we pray that we would learn from this story. We pray that we would learn from from the wise virgins, Lord, that we would, that we would be ready, that we would examine our lives uh, frequently and, and look at the way that we're living and live that ready life for you, that we would be disciples that, that are sold out for you, that are making disciples and, and, and enjoying your word. We pray that we would learn from the, from the foolish virgins, Lord. We pray that we, would, um, that we would not depend on someone else for our faith, that we wouldn't look anywhere else, but that that you would help us to, to have a personal relationship with you. And Father, we learn from the bridegroom. I pray you would help us to, uh, to look to Christ and, and to fix our eyes on the bridegroom. Lord, we, we, we look forward to that, to that celebration, to being in the presence of our Lord. And I pray that you would, um, you would help that looking forward to, to motivate us, to be a catalyst for us to, to look at the way we're living and, and live in a way that's ready, that's excited for your coming. 
For we pray these things in Christ's name. Amen.